My name is Mitch Reams. I'm a graduate of the UOSOJC. I now write for Adweek, The Verge, and other various esports publications while hosting an esports podcast in partnership with Reuters. I'm Will Parton, a doctoral candidate in communication at the University of North Carolina, where I research the role of technology and cultural industries. So esports are organized professional video game competition. They involve people who have become so talented at a particular game that other people are willing to watch them play. And I think media makers should care about them because they are an exciting, emerging cultural industry, and it's a major place where young people are going to sort of watch competitive content. Esports are quite simply competitive video games. Uh, as just like sports encompass a wide range of different sports and different activities, so do esports encompassing different genres, different areas of the world, uh, and different demographics of people who play them. Uh, they matter to media makers because it's a growing industry and something that brands, fans, and people are all very interested in. And so for media, that's where media shines, is educating people about something that they might not know about. And esports matters because People are going there, especially young people, and there are tons and tons of stories, uh, investigative work, and just content to be produced that isn't being produced right now. So esports does go back to the 1970s, at least if we're looking at when people actually first start getting paid for playing video games. And in fact, in the 80s, uh, Taco Bell is sponsoring uh, arcade game players. That's a really interesting kind of hidden history. Um, but esports really take off as sort of a, a sustainable and long-term thing in Korea in the late 90s and early 2000s. And this is sort of because of a confluence of factors. Uh, one is that there's a major financial crisis in the area, and one of the ways the government responds is by by putting a huge amount of money into a national broadband network. This makes uh, internet access cheap and easy, and you have large numbers, sort of a population bomb of young people who actually are playing a lot of games, and out of this kind of primordial soup, um, people start to recognize you know, the status of the best players, and very quickly, a lot of domestic corporations capitalize on that and sort of create this entire sort of infrastructure around, in particular, the game StarCraft. Um, it takes a little bit longer for that process to happen, in other places. Uh, it happens in Europe a little sooner than it does in North America, in part because of the actual like national TV markets are much smaller. And so it's actually much easier to get on and sort of get the ad funding that will support tournaments and players. Um, and certainly in the US, it really gets going uh, around 2010 at this moment when publishers are shifting from an old model of distributing video games that uh, involved you know, paying 60 bucks up front for the game uh, to doing free to play models where it doesn't cost anything to start playing, but you're going to monetize a little bit over a long period of time. And a lot of publishers looked at esports essentially as a marketing opportunity that would keep people interested in their games for a long time. Esports, the games that are very popular in America are going to be very different from the ones that are popular in China. And Asia drives a lot of the esports audience, and especially the difference is most stark on mobile games. Mobile games are super big in underdeveloped regions because high-end gaming PCs are very expensive. So those regions are now being dominated by mobile titles. We're seeing that in China, we're seeing that in India, and we're seeing that in South America, especially Brazil, where these mobile titles are really being the dominant game in those areas. In America, it's more console-based games. You see games like Fortnite and Rocket League that are very popular because these are games that started on Xbox and PlayStation. Whereas in Europe, you might be seeing more games that are native to PC, like Counter-Strike. Uh, so a lot of it uh, goes back to the uh, the system and the platform that you're playing on and where that's popular. And then different audiences enjoy different things. Some games aren't even available in China. And so that allows other games to take that spot. PUBG is a good example there, where Fortnite wasn't in China for a very long time. And then it becomes, so they choose PUBG instead. So there's, it's a very complex world ecosystem, but yes, things change very drastically country to country. I think one of the biggest issues facing esports is toxicity in games. Uh, this needs to be covered more and more about how games are adapting themselves to welcome in uh, women especially and prevent toxicity in online ranked because men and women can compete at the highest levels in esports and we're seeing it happen in a few cases 
but not nearly as much as they should when this is a level playing field between genders. And so I think a lot more research needs to be done about how to include women and uplift uh, female spaces in esports. So one of the main things that I think uh, esports journalists don't always catch are sort of the broader historical and cultural trends that are going on today. So there was an incident a few months ago when um, a, a Hong Kong-based player of the game Hearthstone um, spoke in support of the Hong Kong protests and was, it was summarily banned from playing for a year by the publisher. Uh, and this was sort of a clear instance of esports are not separate from these broader social and cultural dynamics happening today. Um, but oftentimes, a lot of esports beat reporters aren't necessarily, um, you know, highly versed in these kinds of trends. So I think there's a lot of opportunity to be done in trying to connect uh, esports to bigger cultural and political stories, um, not just in sort of these moments of crisis like the Hong Kong uh, um, protests, uh, but also, you know, stories of the long-term tensions between Korea and Japan or why there's not a major esports industry in Japan. These are, are interesting things that I think would involve esports journalists getting a little deeper into something slightly outside of their field. The biggest one is a lack of stability at your starting places. So I've worked for 12 different esports or gaming related publications. Three of them have gone under. So you're going to see that happen quite often. A, a site starts up, they hire a bunch of freelancers or even people on contract. They run up through their runway without, uh, without monetizing their platform. And so they end up going under or cutting rates. And you have to be very quick on your toes uh, as you see what's changing in esports and not commit to one publication all the time. That's why freelancing works very well because ultimately there's a lack of stability and a lack of payment at a lot of these different publications. Probably the biggest opportunity in esports is that the barrier to entry is, at least in a technical sense, very low. Um, there are lots of uh, outlets that maybe won't pay you very much, um, but also offer visibility for your work, and you can certainly engage in all kinds of self-publishing and get an audience very quickly. Um, this is, I think, especially true is if you have some sort of training and facility with sort of traditional journalistic methods, that can put you to the front of the pack pretty quickly um, because a lot of people are um, fans who may not otherwise have sort of special training in sort of how to actually package a story in an attractive way. Um, so that, that's one of the big opportunities. As far as the challenges go, uh, you know, esports are not separate from the broader challenges that journalism is facing as a field. Um, there are issues with how it's an effective way to monetize content. How does mon content get, um, you know, what kinds of content are actually align with sort of the highly iterable and shareable, you know, viral centric media that is most privileged by today's media ecosystems. Uh, and so in that sense, there is a lot of instability in the industry. There are, um, you know, the rates are not very good. And um, but I, I, my point is that these are not separate from the sort of the bigger challenges that journalism faces today. Esports is a very small part of games journalism. The websites like Polygon and IGN uh, dwarf the esports sites out there because gaming is such a massive industry, bigger than music and movies and total revenues. And those stories are wildly expansive. Uh, esports is only just a small subsection of that. So uh, I haven't done a lot of work in the games journalism space, but it is one of the uh, massive opportunities for journalists. There are so many stories to be told about a variety of titles. So esports are absolutely part of this broader trend uh, happening across developed societies where the information technology sector has become sort of the most vital and dynamic part of the economy. Um, we see this in a range of industries, whether it's short-term housing becoming increasingly dependent upon things like Airbnb, uh, whether it's you know legacy media is now increasingly tied to the business models of social media, um, or taxis are increasingly having their market share eroded by Uber. I look at esports as being something that is reflective of this broader trend where these really vital sectors of civic society are becoming dependent upon privatized media infrastructures. And I don't want to necessarily say this is a good or a bad thing. Um, it comes with both pros and cons. Um, but this is, I think, one way that sort of the key technologies of esports, uh, be they cloud computing that run the servers behind many of these games, the actual digital distribution platforms that regulate access to games the same way that Disney Plus might regulate access 
access to particular shows. Um, those are sort of, the, I think, some of the really key things to understand about how esports are part of these broader transformations in media. With technology constantly changing, it's also changing what games people are focusing on. Uh, I mentioned mobile platforms at a previous answer, and that's one of the big uh, changes that's happening across esports is these mobile phones are really advancing quickly, and that's allowing an entirely new type of game to be played on that. It's expanding esports in regions, especially like India and Brazil, are two major growth regions that are happening completely on the backs of mobile technology. In terms of streaming platforms, the ubiquity of people moving over to Twitch and cord cutting is allowing for esports to have a lot more eyes on it as people, as there's no longer a question of what do I visit? They're all watching everything online anyway. And so Twitch is now just part of a Hulu and a Netflix rotation, where previously you'd have to be on cable to reach that audience. I think the esports journalists can learn from sports journalists in a variety of ways. And one of the main ones is holding people's feet to the fire. Uh, right now, esports publishers control a lot of the power. And it's hard to critique them because they can really cut off your content source. And so esports journalists uh, needs to get into a place where they could really hold these publishers like Riot Games, like Activision Blizzard, accountable for things they do poorly. And that's something that's starting to change, but it's something that we see in sports journalism a lot, and I want to see more of it in esports. So I have a, a special interest in creative nonfiction and long form writing. And so looking back to people who have written profiles on sports stars, um, I think is an area that is often an, sort of underrepresented in esports uh, and thinking about how it's you know, not just straight ahead reporting, but there's these opportunities to sort of tell stories at word lengths of 3,000, 4,000, 5,000 words, and this incredibly rich tradition of really wonderful writers who have sort of pioneered of how do you keep a reader interested that long? Um, so for me, looking back to sort of those masters is a way, as something that esports journalists can do to sort of enrich the kind of writing they're doing and sort of tell new and deeper stories about professional gaming. The reason I like to push people into esports journalism is because there are very few gatekeepers in it, and there aren't a lot of old people that understand it. So for a student, you can become an expert and a leader in your field quite quickly. Uh, ESPN's leading esports reporter is 22 years old. He didn't even get a college degree, and he's you know, driving those huge multi-million dollar acquisitions. So for students, I like to push people into esports because I think there's a lot of opportunity for young journalists. Uh, so gambling is a really interesting question in esports because there are certainly, um, you know, DraftKings does have an esports presence. I think FanDuel has one. Um, there are sometimes it's legally it can be very a little tricky uh, whether or not you can do that in a particular state. Um, but there's also all kinds of esports fantasy leagues and whatnot. But the sticking point is often the fact that. Uh, game publishers own the data about esports, and so in some ways these things exist um, in a somewhat precarious spot where if publishers say, hey, you're doing this with you know, our data and our information, they can get shut down. Then they might not necessarily choose to do that because there are good reasons that um, you know, Riot Games or someone else is not, run it, not running a real money betting platform that opens up all kinds of conflict of interest questions. Um, but it does, there is, I think, a, a tricky position there that doesn't really exist in traditional sports because most of the data about in-game performance is considered public domain. Um, so that's another sort of shift between you know, things becoming increasing, increasingly privatized. Betting on esports is one of the biggest growth opportunities and also one of the most sketchy parts of esports right now. One of the biggest issues is lack of regulation. So I was just talking to somebody at Caesars Palace, I live in Las Vegas, and they are not touching esports. Nowhere on the strip is because there is no guarantee in place to prevent people from throwing games. And the revenues for esports players are not high enough to prevent this. So you think back to the scandals that have hit betting in sports in the past, uh, especially college basketball in the 70s and 80s. Esports is ripe for that kind of issues as kids are, first of all, I call them kids because they're 16, 17, 18 years old, easily bought off with $40,000 to throw a game. And so it's really a dangerous area
in a lot of ways, but it's also going to be a huge growth point in the future. Unicorn is one of the companies leading this esports betting charge. Uh, it's got investors like Mark Cuban and Ashton Kutcher. It has its own cryptocurrency, although it doesn't isn't worth anything right now. Uh, and so esports betting is going to be a huge thing, and it's also going to be a source of major controversy, and it's just a matter of time.